So before I start anything I always do, I always start with our four major numbers. You gotta know where you're at financially, all right? So I'm sharing with you my numbers. Uh, as of 2021, uh, my income is averaging roughly 25K a month, sometimes a little bit higher. Uh, expenses are roughly 15,000. They actually have gone up. Expenses have gone up due to hyperinflation, cost of goods and services going up. And also uh, I will be relocating my office space and doing some uh, moves for 2022. So my expenses have gone up roughly three to 4,000. So I'm overestimating 15K a month. Debt is at zero. I owe no man nothing. Uh, and then cash flow is roughly 10,000 a month. Cash flow is money that's left over that does not have a purpose just yet. And it is waiting to be deployed into some kind of investment, some type of uh, partnership, co-venture, whatever that may be. And uh, I know everyone typically has a process before they invest. Some don't. I think it's always very wise to have a plan before you invest in anything, before you deploy money into any opportunity, is to run it through a, a, a processing system um, where you can gather your thoughts. Your thoughts can become ideas. Your ideas can become a concept. Your concept can become your theology, right? And then your theology becomes a, a philosophy. And once it's a philosophy, very hard to break, especially when you've got the right one. I believe we have the right one, Kingdom Commonwealth, okay? I think it's a combination of many systems that are in the world today, little hints. Um, and so we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna have some fun here and I'm gonna kind of break it up into different sections and then open it up to Q&A a little later. So the first section is know your numbers, right? Always gotta know it. What's coming in, what's going out, what's left over, and what are any liabilities, okay? The three steps um, that I connected, I connected with a gentleman recently by the name of Joe Sugg, who's a, a, a millionaire, does real estate, he has investments, he has a YouTube channel. His mission right now is very aligned with mine. He's looking to build the kingdom economy right going back to that economic arc um, and i can give people his information youtube channel a little bit later but he broke down building wealth into like three simple steps and i've been taking that lately and using it uh in my own strategy and step one is literally to increase your income the goal in my opinion should be to get to roughly two hundred and fifty thousand a year in income or higher why is that the moment you start making over 250,000 a year and you do that consecutively for at least two years or longer, you become what's called an accredited investor, okay? As an accredited investor in the United States, you get access to what are called non-public investments, okay? And then there are public investments. Today, if you wanna buy a stock, if you wanna buy a house, if you want to buy a bond, a mutual fund, a treasury note, these are all public investments. It doesn't matter how much money you have, how much money you make, what you have in savings. If it's public, anyone can access it. A non-public investment is uh, something kind of like a, say a, one example would be a preferred stock or tier one asset, something like a, in the real estate world, where let's say... Um, I'm, I'm sure most of us are familiar with uh, a guy named Grant Cardo. Okay, you can find him online. He's a billionaire, does real estate, and he does what's called syndication. So he syndicates, he, he acquires money from many different people. He gets money from accredited investors and non-accredited investors. And there's two different pools. If you're a non-accredited investor, you get access to this in terms of your returns versus if you're an accredited investor, you get access to a lot more opportunities, tier one, double digit returns, better access keys to a kingdom, AKA the United States. This is how the United States operates. If you were to look at many different cultures and demographics in the United States, it's pretty interesting how majority of Americans we're talking 70 80 percent live paycheck to paycheck and the average income in america 2021 somewhere in the neighborhood of 60,000 a year and it's very interesting how you're taught to save your money invest in the stock market and mutual funds for 40 years accumulate maybe a million two million by the time you're 
59 and a half and then withdraw those funds to live off of for the rest of your life. And meanwhile, while you're working, you're encouraged to obtain debt like cars, student loans, credit cards, personal loans, mortgage, and you spend your whole life paying off your debt like a good citizen, right? Take all this time in the world to pay off your debt. Most people take a lot of time because they don't make a what? They don't make a lot of money. And you're supposed to save a portion of your money and invest a portion of your money all to what? Liquidate it in your later 50s and 60s and you never reach accreditation status. I find that very interesting. So some will argue and some will say that that particular uh, accredited investor status is a very unique way to suppress and oppress certain demographics. We won't get into that, right? But I just want you to see what structures you currently live under. And then I'm gonna share with you kingdom. And then you get to decide which one do you wanna operate under, okay? And when you make that decision, uh, just know that is whichever route you go, it ain't gonna be easy. It is not gonna be easy because you're gonna have to unlearn and relearn if you decide to go the kingdom route. And if you decide to stay in the world, you're gonna have to work your tail off. You gotta make over 250,000 a year consecutively or have a million dollars plus in net worth. And guess what? Your house, your primary residence is not part of your net worth. A lot of people think it is, but it is not. That's crazy. And that is the number one purchase that majority of Americans make is a home, primary residence, but you can't add it to your net worth. And arguably, that's most of people's net worth, especially if they pay off the house. So step one, increase your income to 250,000 or higher, okay? Become accredited. Step two, acquire assets that produce cash flow, real estate, dividend paying stocks, cash value life insurance, small business, partnerships, lending, you name it, go down the list. Once you've acquired assets that produce cash flow, regardless of your physical work and time put into it, this is where money starts to work for you and you not for it, okay? And then step three is to wrap the assets. You have to protect the assets. How do you protect assets? Insurance, lawyers, doctors, CPAs, family office, trust, will, estate planning, multiple layers of trust and protection, and you name it, go down the whole list, okay? These same three steps are going to be the same steps in the kingdom, but they're gonna be a lot easier to achieve success because in this system of building wealth, it's all based on individual performance. It's based off of you, what you can do, right? Regardless of where you come from, your background, grew up without a daddy, grew up without a mommy, whatever, whatever your situation was, none of that matters in the current system you live under, right? That does not matter. What matters is what are you going to do with your life and how are you going to build wealth and how are you going to achieve financial success? So that's the public, that's the world system that you and I, most of us live under. In a kingdom, works a lot differently. In, I'll give you one example. In the world, there are contracts. In the kingdom, there's a covenant, okay? That's one example. Contracts is a promise. Covenants provide a stronger guarantee. Covenant is just based off blood, right? It's very interesting. Contract says I own and you own, and I agree that you own it, and you agree that I own it, and I'm gonna give it to you, right? Covenant says you don't own it, it belongs to the king, and the king gives you access to the resources. As long as the member agrees that they don't own it, then the king will release it to him or her to manage, where they will have what they need in abundance. Versus a contract, you've gotta go through all these different steps. And a covenant, very different. So that's the second component, is understanding how the, the full entire system works to produce actual wealth that is substantial, okay? Now, the next thing I wanna share with you is this triangle right here, this little pyramid structure, and this has to deal with law and how the law recognizes a particular structure. Again, what I just shared with you is how you and I can build wealth in the United States or in any country for that matter and how to properly do it where you can 
have enough money to, you know, command and have your own personal will through a corporation, through a business to do what you please. Now I want to share with you the different levels of law and how jurisdictions work, how the law applies to wealth preservation and building wealth for the long term. The very first level of law is called admiralty law. This has to do with the law of the sea, okay? Law of the sea. Most of us do not realize that you and I are currently operating under admiralty maritime law. And I'm just gonna give you some tidbits that you can ponder on. Um, and I've, I took a bunch of notes, so bear with me here. And you can write some of this stuff down. I'm gonna go nice and slow. So admiralty law, okay, are, like I said, it's the law of the sea. And there are some key words like bank, merchant, captain, ships. And I'm gonna break down how these words apply to our current justice system here in the United States and abroad, and many other countries. Okay, so I'll give you uh, one example here. This is little tidbits. Like I said, I don't even know what I'm saying, but before I came on, I prayed that the Holy Spirit would take over um, and influence through my vocal cords to say the right stuff. And just to remind you to always be transparent. Uh, I'm 25 years old. I'm learning. We're going to learn together. We're going to grow together. If I'm wrong on anything, correct me at any point in time. But if I'm right, ponder on it, sit with it, see how it makes you feel, study it, and confirm it for me so that we know how to conduct ourselves as kingdom citizens as we continue to grow. So first thing I want to share with you, little tidbit, all ships are considered female, okay? I, I didn't understand that. Um, but when a ship arrives into a port, it sits in her berth. All ships carry a manifesto, right? A manifest. It, a manifest contains all of the what? Resources that the ship has. And when the ship arrives into port, it releases in the water. Think of how a female gives birth, water, water breaks, a baby comes out, right? A ship, this is why ships are all female, it has resources and those resources come onto land and depending on how the law is written those resources will come into the land and that is where you'll have the law of the land and that is typically common law case law right or i should say uh, uh civil law is the right word i believe yes civil law common law in the united states we operate under common law and I believe most of Europe uh, still operates under civil law. And uh, civil law, just so you know, began with the Romans. Nearly all of Europe uses it today. It's codified, it's from the government. It's less flexible than common law uh, and requires many different steps for the law to change. So it can be changed, but all the power is in the government versus a common law started with the English and they use case law. So based on previous cases, judges will determine a current case and how to proceed with it. So it has precedence. They're able to create law. The judges are able to interpret the law as it was written and it's chosen from the people. Typically the people have the power, okay? So admiralty law is the lowest ranking level of law right above that is international law, okay? Component right above that. I encourage you to draw this out for yourself as I'm talking. Right above that is international law. Okay? And international law has to do with, you know, laws between nations. How do kings and queens conduct themselves in different territories, in different domains, okay? Right above that is common law and civil law. This is where the people have more power than the government that rules over the people and uh, conducts business okay this is interesting stuff like i said if i'm if you're lost at any point in time just pray in the holy spirit that this communicates to your to your to your heart to your soul to your mind and it'll sink into your subconscious mind as you hear it more and more 
and then you'll later begin to comprehend it. It took me quite some time, so to try to squeeze it into a session is going to be difficult. But uh, just know that I'm not going anywhere. I'm coming back, you know, on a monthly basis, and I want to make myself available for every single one of you as we continue to grow together. Okay? So Admiralty Law, Law of the Sea, International Law, that's laws between nations, between countries, uh, based off of particular territories. Common Law, it's the a higher level of protection for the people okay and then at the very tippy top you have ecclesiastical law okay ecclesiastical law is god's law god's law is recognized in all 50 states and by every nation in the world via the u.s code our tax code here in the u.s and under the united nations okay very interesting stuff um what what helps me believe that is when I look at the, the Bible and different different case studies where demons approached Jesus, when Satan approached Jesus, they all had to ask him permission to do a certain thing. Kind of like when the two demon possessed men uh, asked Jesus to go into the pigs that were running off of a cliff. They had to ask him permission, just like Satan had to ask God permission to test Job. So you mean to tell me that the evilest of it all, Satan, still has to ask permission to conduct his will? Yeah. So that means all the nations, all the governments, whether they believe in God or not, recognize ecclesiastical law as the highest form of law which protects the kingdom citizens of that particular kingdom, God's kingdom. The utmost respect problem is you're not being taught ecclesiastical law why why are you not being taught about ecclesiastical law one theory that i have in my mind is if i can convince you that you are not a king that you are not a queen if i can get you to sign adhesion contracts which surrenders your covenant in the kingdom i own you just a theory okay Maybe there's some truth. I want you all to do additional studies. You all have been on planet Earth longer than I have. Okay. So it is very important for us to spend as much humanly possible time we can on studying what is ecclesiastical law and how you and I as kingdom citizens can operate together under a covenant, which is protected so that we can achieve wealth together and distribute that either via a public ledger of some sort through an acts based stewardship. And we have to understand that we don't own it. The moment we own things, we can look at case studies. We can look at the children of Israel. Why did they not make it to the promised land? Why did they not make it? They fled Egypt. They were freed. So they had liberty, but they still didn't have freedom because they still had the spirit of slavery inside of them they still had the spirit of doubt and fear and worry and uh they, they were they were still relying on these particular systems so they never got to see the promised land and then when the when the two actually made it to the promised land then we've got the 12 tribes of judah and they were operating under kingdom commonwealth for quite some time and they began to lose focus because they wanted a king outside of god being their king they wanted a king and that's where we got ooh, what was it Solomon King Saul Solomon and that's when the 12 tribes of Judah started to crumble because they started operating outside of covenant and they started getting into contracts such as lending they started lending outside of their culture and the scripture that talks about the uh the oh my goodness well, how do I say it the borrower is slave to the lender I think a lot of people don't realize that literally meant slavery in that time that if you did not pay the debt back you became a slave in today's time slavery isn't such a pretty word anymore so we have to in the systems that we live in we got to freshen it up a little bit so that the people can operate like cattle okay they're chattelled into operating in certain ways that makes you feel like you have liberty and certain freedoms but little do you know, the more contracts you sign, okay, over and over again in these systems, you're releasing more and more freedoms from your covenant. 
that you originally have as a king and a queen. But the problem is we're not being taught this, this, this language. And I'm going to drop little things that uh, can help us understand well, what is the language of the kingdom in terms of money, finances, and, and law. And how can that be our fundamentals? Just like what Eddie was saying earlier, how marriages tend to be more successful the moment the couple, the, 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 the household makes over 200 grand a year. The divorce rate goes down to 20% as opposed to it being around 60%. I believe what he said around when couples make about 100,000 or less, they have a 60% chance of failing based off money alone, not looks, not cheating, not uh, miscommunication, uh, none of that, not even abuse, none of that. Money alone, you have a 60% failure rate if you do not make more than 200 grand a year. Again, back to my point. These numbers are very interesting how these stats start to play out. And it's it's very interesting how the the people of the kingdom have this belief that God's just going to do it all. And that is dangerous, in my opinion, that God's just going to solve it all and God's just going to do it. Okay, maybe he will, maybe he won't. I don't know. But when I look at covenant, when I look at contracts, when I look at the law, you'd be surprised how much access you and I both have, but we're not accessing it uh, properly. We're, we're praying a prayer that's already been done. We're hoping and praying for things that's already been done. And all we have to do now is get the proper education. We're living in a time we're being flooded with information overload. We're being flooded with distractions to keep you on your toes, keep you stressed the heck out, right? Keep you from using this, your, your, your brain. Most of us are operating here from the heart. Very dangerous, by the way. If that's all you do is operate from, oh, well, I feel like I love them. What? Uh, what do you mean you feel? Today I feel good. Tomorrow I don't. Today I feel like working out. Tomorrow I don't. Very dangerous to operate from here. You operate from here. Hey, homeboy. Uh, how much debt you got? Okay, before, okay, I like that you put the ring on it. Okay, that says you love me, but um, hmm, what's your money situation looking like? Is God really going to take care of us just because we... Okay, no, we, we can get into those arguments. But I start looking at co covenant. I start looking at kingdom. This couldn't be more just tangible. Like, this is so logical. I can actually... I can take this and I can go do something with it. Okay? So, with that being said... Just to recap here, you need to know your numbers. You need to know where you stand, right? In society today, three steps to creating wealth. Focus on increasing your income. Become an accredited investor as fast as humanly possible, okay? Step two, acquire assets that produce cash flow, real estate, stocks, small business, okay? Third is you got to wrap the assets, protected, insurance, protection, lawyers, doctors, CPAs, family office, trusts, wills, estate planning, attorneys, you name it. Okay, then we need to, um, as we're doing this, we need to educate ourselves about ecclesiastical law. We need to find any book, any article, the Bible itself, anywhere, everywhere that talks about ecclesiastical law. We need to consume that information. We need to gather it, put it together in some type of program that we can uh, pass on to our children so they can understand how to operate in covenant and lessen contracts. Okay. The moment you sign a contract, such as becoming a citizen of a particular country, you are essentially surrendering your will to that country's will. Okay, so I'm a U.S. citizen. Um, I have rights as an American citizen, but the the rights that I have, the civil rights that I have, um, can be taken away. Right? They're they're actually privileges. When you start looking at our at our laws, you look at the 14th Amendment, you look at civil rights, um, you look at our, our history um, a, a, through word magic and through legalese, legal terms, we've slowly but surely have surrendered our rights as citizens and we've given the government too much control, right? And that's not the way a government's supposed to operate, okay? We've seen and we, we can look at history, we can see how many governments have failed in the past. Looking at the Roman Empire, looking at the British Empire, right? How how look at the conquistadors? Look how how many governments in the past have have failed 
dramatically due to uh, extracting all of the rights from the citizens, from the members, and making it replacing God with government. Very dangerous to do. So those are the two components there. We talked about the levels of law, admiralty law, law of the sea, international law, laws between countries, common law, civil law. That has to do with civil rights, rights within a country on the land, law of the land. Okay. Then there's ecclesiastical law. Um, and right in between God's law, ecclesiastical law, and common law, you've got tribal law. Okay, tribal law has to do with, you know, a prime example would be like the Native American Indians, right? They have specific rights, exemptions that apply only to them. So if you have the blood of a Native American Indian, all right, or Native American or whatever they were called at one point, if you can identify as that through blood, you've got a particular covenant and you can operate under that particular tribe and then you can increase income tax-free, acquire assets tax-free, wrap the assets tax-free and conduct yourselves accordingly within that tribe. So tribal law is right below ecclesiastical law. And the reason for that is sometimes I'm not I'm not throwing shots at any particular nation, creed or religion, but and you can look at history, but the moment a tribe right the moment a tribe starts worshiping idols multiple gods you can look at their history and you can see every single one of them failing the moment they start worshiping statues look at the canaanites um look at you know i was looking at i was looking at my own culture uh, puerto ricans in particular when i look at native puerto ricans um, we have a lineage that goes all the way back to africa okay and then when you look at the island of Puerto Rico, you go early. There were certain tribes in Puerto Rican culture that were worshiping stones or whatever, right? Idols, many gods. They're no longer here today. Their culture has been wiped from the face of the earth, okay? Very little of them remain today. So we can see how if you're operating in tribal law or anything below that, it can get interrupted, destroyed very quickly, either by God or from another culture that seeks to conquer and kill, destroy, deceit, whatever that may be. But under ecclesiastical law, under a covenant with God and God's people, it's very interesting how it's never failed still to this day. And we've seen signs of, of rise and falls of cultures and how they veer off. But when you look at the overall structures of the entire world, look at all the nations, how we operate globally, um, with between different nations, they all recognize the ecclesia, which is the church. The church is the body. The body is you and I. They wreck so evil recognizes it, but the believers don't see it, which is interesting to me. And so my hope is as I'm giving you these pieces to the puzzle, because I'm still putting it together myself via the whiteboard, right? My hope is that we can one day, someday come together as soon as humanly possible and have an economic arc built ready to go for when things crash when crisis comes when chaos hits we will be operating outside of their jurisdiction have you ever wondered why major drug cartels major sex trafficking rings the jeffrey epsteins of the world you ever wonder why they don't get caught you ever wonder why it takes so long to, to, to get these people, it's because they're operating outside of jurisdiction. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but like when we look at military branches, they have to get like what's called the green light. You know, uh, when we went after Osama bin Laden, it took months to get the green light to go get him and take him out. Months to get that, uh, probably years even, who knows how long it took just to get the green light on one guy who clearly maybe was the mastermind of 9-11, right? Understand, we've got the technology. We knew where this guy was. I'm pretty sure. With our government and our coalition of other governments, we knew where that guy was camping. But did we have jurisdiction? The moment a government violates their own laws, another government can come in and challenge that and dethrone them. Which is why we see the amount of chaos 
and evil that happens in the world and we sometimes question god how come you didn't fix that god how come you didn't fix that god how can you do that it's because if he intervenes in any way that violates his own law satan can dethrone him and challenge him and say uh-uh your law says this what are you doing you can't do that right so law laws and jurisdictions very important so i want to get into how right because i'm a solution guy i'm a strategist i don't know about motivational talks and i don't know about all that stuff i'm i'm learning it but i have always been solution focused okay great you just told me about laws and what i got to do and all stuff but like how do i actually go in out and do it okay so i created a little system right here this bottom part this is my fourth component breaking this down and then i'm going to get your thoughts in a little bit here so first thing step one educate 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 i just gave it to you learn everything you possibly can about ecclesiastical law your average pastor probably can't even spell ecclesiastical law right so spend time learn it live it love it breathe it know your rights or you don't have any give you a prime example of what what it means to not know your rights my father before i was born or maybe right as i was born was convicted of a crime and was sentenced to prison for many years this man did not do the crime ladies and gentlemen not that particular crime i'm pretty sure he's broken god's covenant at some point in time and has sinned we've all sinned i get it but that particular crime he did not do he fit the description he fit the profile the dude was in the hospital the day the robbery took place okay so this man does 10 11 years in prison and then was proven innocent and released i guarantee you if this man my father if he was operating under ecclesiastical law outside of their jurisdiction if he had the right covenant okay i guarantee you if he knew his rights he'd be operating like the white folks and i'm not i'm not trying to be racist i'm just we're just looking at facts okay we're looking at facts we're looking at case studies we're looking at law we're looking at probabilities of success when you walk in the courts right do you have proper standing in the court if somebody convicts you of a crime today what is the likelihood of you properly defending yourself in the courts in the supreme court in the state courts whatever it is of any nation of any culture can you honestly say that you know your rights most of us do not that's dangerous very dangerous so there are many people who are sitting in prison today of many different cultures that are doing time for the wrong crime <laughs> okay that's a prime example of what it means to truly not know your rights i'm not trying to scare anybody i'm not trying to you know uh get you all worried but it helps when you're when you're able to truly put on the full body armor of god it helps it helps when you know your rights it helps when you can conduct yourself properly right you know if you ever get pulled over by, by the police they'll say a couple things to you and they'll say do you understand okay that word understand literally means to stand under his authority okay when you say yes you just surrendered to his authority little do you know you pay for that officer to protect you day and night you pay for his salary through your taxes that man woman police officer they work for you not you work for them so when they ask you that you say no 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 I don't stand under your authority. I comprehend what you're saying. I just don't stand under your authority. Okay. Little thing. I'm just throwing little tidbits. I just like, oh my God, what did he just say? Look up the root words of things and you can see through word magic, how little they, little by little, they take, they take, they take, they take, they take, they take, they take. Okay. So educate. Step one. Step two is become a co-vester. Okay. Drop the I in the word invest 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 you know all the financial gurus yeah yeah you gotta invest you gotta invest i've said it myself thousands of times it's not the way to go i'm learning this okay i've got a lot to learn got a lot to give drop the i and invest the moment you do that you're operating outside of jurisdiction they cannot tax you if you become a co-vester you're cooperatively vesting to create common wealth Break the word commonwealth down. Comes from the word common wheel, okay? Community, the 
the wealth, the riches, the glory of the community in a king domain. Oh my goodness. I hope I'm getting through to someone at this point in time. And I, 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 I hope that for some of you it's landing. And even if it's flying over your head, that you just stick with it all the way through because we're, we're getting deep. So if you drop the I in invest and you become a co-vestor, right? You start co-vesting, you start cooperatively vesting in opportunities under an ecclesiastical trust, which is run by the king. And you and I are simply managers, stewards. We're not CEOs anymore. We're not CFOs. We're not COOs. We're not employees. We are ministers of finance. We are bona fide participating members who voluntarily give our time, talent, and treasure to the kingdom. Willingly, voluntarily, engaging in a relationship with our creator, which is what he truly wants. He does not want robots. He does not want slaves. He wants a free will being to freely love him and engage in a relationship with him inside the ecclesia. The ecclesia is God's bride. That's us, his sons and daughters. That's our relationship with him, okay? Once you become a covester, your goal is then to convert the fiat money, this stuff, this paper currency, okay? Convert this money into God's money. What is God's money? It's referred to in the Bible as what gold and silver gold and silver is god's money doesn't it come from the earth then god create the earth uh-oh so if you convert fiat money these worthless pieces of trash dollars australian dollars pesos euros pounds you name it it's all worthless it's not backed by anything other than the full faith and credit of your country of which you serve little do you know so <clears throat> you convert that into God's money, gold and silver. How do you do that? By understanding everything you can about, again, ecclesiastical law, and you're gonna come across a terminology called an FBO. It stands for a faith-based organization, all right? It stands for faith-based organization. And the term is a 508C1A, title 26, the US code, all right? Do some time, do some research on that very topic. I've mentioned it before. This is the structure in legalese terms to define the ecclesiastical trust, God's kingdom, for the members, you and I, to operate under a faith-based organization where our funds, our resources are backed by gold and silver. Once we have enough gold and silver accumulated in the church, aka the ecclesia, our then next step is to leverage God's money to create cash flow. How do you leverage? Through debt, okay? Through lending. You and I coming together, cooperatively combining all of our incomes and resources and cash flows together to acquire the gold and the silver, okay? We acquire enough gold and silver like other countries do and other nations do, we then approach lenders, banking institutions, corporations, and we can collateralize the gold and the silver to acquire assets that produce cash flow. Here's the phenomenal thing about being under an ecclesia, kingdom, faith based organization. You get access to all this non public investments. You and I don't have to qualify. We're already qualified through the covenant, which is recognized in all 50 states and the United Nations. Okay. So we acquire assets. And because we're under a faith based organization, Ecclesia, we're tax accepted. We never owed the tax to begin with to any country whatsoever. So we can operate globally anywhere in the world. Right. <clears throat> and we can acquire real estate, small business, cryptos, stocks, preferred stocks, you name it, all under the Ecclesia of which royalties, not income, take the word I out of it, income, royalties, and receive royalty cash flow currency inside that kingdom of which the members can now 
exchange. So instead of buying and selling, you and I are merely exchanging our time, talent, and treasure amongst each other via exchange, almost like bartering, right? And so just imagine inside of an ecclesia that there are lawyers, doctors, attorneys, financial people, financial consultants, relationship coaches, life coaches, farmers, carpenters, architects, all operating under one will. Can I give you an example of how that could potentially look like? Okay, we can look at our history. Um, and this is very, very close to home here in the US. But in a prime example is Black Wall Street. I believe, I don't know this for a fact, but I believe Black Wall Street was operating under an ecclesia, maybe God's kingdom, maybe not. I don't know. I'm willing to bet that when it comes to black folks, um, of all the churches I've ever attended, I've never seen people worship and pray like black people do. It's amazing. I come from the Catholic background in Catholic churches, Spanish. We don't even get up our out of our seats unless we're told to. Um, we pray, uh, we sing in one accord. Hallelujah. Uh-uh. And when I've gone to the the Baptist church, uh, hung with Jamaican churches and Haitian churches, oh my God, the um, I'm like the roof's gonna come off in here. What's going on? So I'm willing to bet that Black Wall Street was operating under either tribal law or the ecclesia, the kingdom, and they were operating under one will, and they had their culture. And they owned everything under the ecclesia. So I'm willing to bet that the entrepreneurs, the farmers of that land in uh, in Oklahoma, was it Tulsa, Oklahoma? None of them owned anything. Um, I'd be willing to bet none of them owned anything. They, they all had it in a master trust, probably some kind of family office, which was tax exempt, tax accepted. And they were, I would, I would even be willing to bet that they were probably operating in their own currency. I bet you they probably had their own currency. They were converting dollars probably into their own currency. Maybe, maybe not because back in that time, the US dollar used to be backed by gold. Um, so maybe that's not accurate, but I'm willing to bet that they were exchanging their time, talent, and treasure amongst themselves. And then if they wanted to do business with anyone outside of their kingdom, outside of their domain, they charged higher rates. Think about it. If, if I travel to California, okay, if I come from another country into your domain, you know there's something called a tourist tax, right? So that means if I go to Italy, if I go to another country, another land, I'm going to get charged a higher rate just to be there versus the citizen of that particular land. They don't have to pay that. So I'm willing to bet that in Black Wall Street, I mean, they, everything was owned by the, or I should say managed by the people. And I'd be willing to bet that they were operating under one establishment, one type of jurisdiction that nobody could get to them. And the only way to get to them is to accuse them, right? And then do something that caused havoc and chaos, right? To destroy them, of which the uh, uh, people of that time, whoever was involved, they successfully destroyed them. But the structure did not get destroyed. The physical businesses, the, the physical bodies, the people living there, yes, they died and they perished, but the structure of the kingdom still lives on. And so the people of today that are Bible believers, kingdom citizens, we have examples dating all the way back to Egyptian times, Noah times. We have all these case studies of victories and losses, and we can take all of that, strip all the bad stuff that they did, take all the best of the best, put it all together, 21st century, build an economic arc under an ecclesia, which could be potentially tax accepted if done properly. We educate ourselves everything we can about ecclesiastical law so we can properly conduct ourselves. And I was telling uh, Dr. Eddie Connor in a private conversation, possibly rebuild Black Wall Street. Because here's the interesting thing. Under the kingdom, God's kingdom, he unifies through diversity. So it is only in God's kingdom can a Jew, 
a Hispanic, a Caucasian, an African, a Bahamian, a Jamaican, an Asian. Only his structure can all of those communities come together under one will while still remaining diversified. Like I was saying, you go to a black church, they just, they pray different. They just do things different. I'm amazed by it. I'm even willing to say that I got saved in a black church through the Christian faith because of how they show their faith versus where I come from in the, in the Catholic Roman Catholic background, where, you know, one would argue it's uh, quite boring in there. You know, you can't wait to get out. Got to sing five different Hail Marys um, and different hymns and whatnot. And you don't even know what the heck you're saying half the time. Um, and so that culture helps breed diversity versus like, you know, uh, you hang out with some Spanish folks, you know, we party different, right? We, we got the music, right? We, we just do things different. Hang out with Caucasian people, hang out with a cowboy, hang out with a Muslim, hang out with an Indian, hang out with a, a Chinese person. They all do traditions differently. So think of, think of the Christian faith as a great hall of different traditions, Baptist, Presbyterian, um, seven Adventists, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, um, you know, Paul believers, and uh, just so many different iterations. There's over what 40,000 Christian denominations. Imagine if they all came together under one will, but was diversified in each of their communities because Dr. Eddie's going to talk to his cultural uh, background, I would argue, more effectively than I could because he's going to understand certain things that occur under a certain household than others. And same for me. I'm going to be able to talk to Spanish people probably a lot better, more efficiently than someone of a different culture that doesn't understand what our struggles are, what our uh, 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 habits are or cultures or things like that. You know, you walk into someone's house, they say, hey, take your shoes off. Someone might not say that. Don't take your shoes off. You're fine. Walk around, shoes in the house. Others might say, hey, take your shoes off. It's a culture. But if we can unify under one will in regards to how we conduct ourselves in covenant, in jurisdiction, and how we build and preserve wealth for multiple generations, we just might be onto something. We just might be able to rebuild certain cultures that have lost either their way, their status, their authority, and it's a way to restore, remember who we are in Christ as kings and queens. So the uh, final component I have put over here, just some key kind of takeaways from the main thing is to get to a point where you own nothing, but you control it all. Know the law, know your rights, operate through an acts based stewardship. And I believe these are some key keys of the kingdom to access resources from the source. Uh, with that being said, I am complete, uh, but I'm not finished. All right, we've got a lot of work to do. There's so much that I can't even fit on this whiteboard. There's a lot that's going through my mind, um, but I was hoping to kind of give you the, the, the proper steps on how to really move this thing forward. And, and here is the solution from first, this is as far as I got so far. Education, financial literacy, ecclesiastical law, become a co vessor drop the eye, convert fiat dollars into God's money through gold and silver. And then we got to leverage God's money to create cash flow back into the world, but not be of it. Right? So this isn't a strategy to take down America, to take down Britain, to take down any country. No, you ain't going to do that. I promise you. Evil is way too strong. They are attacking you via a thousand cuts, death by a thousand cuts, small cuts. Okay. So you won't even see it coming. The goal isn't to try to fight those very structures, but to build a structure simultaneously right next to them. So when the wicked fail, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for whom? The righteous. Well, the only way the righteous are going to get it is if they have the right covenant under the right structures of the kingdom. It's the only way you're going to get it. Because even if you do get it under a contract system in here, evil can take it right from under you via suing, via crimes that you don't commit, via uh, restrictions and protocols. So many different ways that they can attack you versus if, if they don't have jurisdiction to attack you. Mm. 
you are in a dangerous position to do a lot of good in a wicked world, okay? A lot of good in a wicked world. So I think we're, we're on to something and this part right here, this last part about leveraging, um, the way, multiple ways of leveraging would be through cash value life insurance, acquiring real estate through debt, borrowing from banking institutions to acquire small businesses and then have that cash flow pay the debt off and understand you're going to be able to pay the debt a lot faster because you're not paying any taxes it's completely tax free within the within the church within the ecclesia okay um, and i want you to do research and those of you that want to take the next step i can connect you with other kingdom citizens i'm gonna i would like to connect all of us to a faith-based organization that is being run operated and managed by by high level pastors business owners lawyers people that understand law again i'm getting in rooms i'm not qualified to be in and it is amazing the things that i'm learning um how the how the rich do it outside of the kingdom and i think i explained it in a, in a previous session where i said you know wealthy people like jeff bezos elon musk uh bill gates they have the structure of the kingdom they call it their empire okay they have the structure they have multiple layers of integrated auxiliary trust master trust a family office lawyers doctors attorneys they got all these protective measures in place right and they're operating here but they're the ones that created it so they're gonna do just fine until they don't do fine right until god steps in and establishes his his kingdom here on here on earth for the thousand year millennia but on until then i want to try to prevent as many premature deaths as possible that that's my goal and i think jesus made a point about his people perish because of lack of knowledge i think perish kind of relates to like a, a premature death well if he had if he or she had the knowledge they wouldn't have perished so therefore they probably would have lived longer and therefore they probably would have passed on the knowledge uh, more effectively